Welcome, my friends, to uh, my uh, uh, channel. Thank you very much for watching the, um, this video. I'm Salah Abbas. I'm a, a surgeon, a general surgeon specialized in liver and uh, pancreatic uh, uh, surgery. And I uh, also uh, am interested in teaching. I have taught for a long time. Uh, and as uh, we record, I will emphasize that uh, this uh, lesson is uh, particularly directed to medical students to help you comprehend and get your head around the uh, major clinical issues that uh, you encounter in surgery. And uh, uh, today, I thought I'd explain to you how to investigate someone who's got uh, or diagnosed with a solid liver mass. We're not going to talk about cystic lesions today. We're going to talk about solid liver masses. And the solid mass is uh, something that you felt clinically or they picked by ultrasound for uh, whatever the reason or the indication that uh, uh, it was done for, or um, during the investigation of abdominal pain or other uh, complaints. Um, and uh, then we find a uh, liver uh, mass, uh, and then in the absence of other uh, pathology, uh, or known pathology in uh, uh, that particular patient, we need to figure out exactly uh, what is uh, this mass uh, is about and why it's there to, in order to be able to uh, advise the patient to what kind of treatment can be uh, directed to it. Now, how do they come to our attention? Uh, some of them are incidental. Uh, well, uh, say if uh, a young lady having a, an ultrasound scan during pregnancy uh, checking the uh, baby and incidentally they look at the liver and they find a uh, mass in the liver. This is a relatively common scenario because focal nodular hyperplasia is a disease of young women, uh, particularly those who have been on years of contraceptive pills. They do sometimes, patients come with pain uh, and that uh, pain usually in the right upper quadrant and sometimes it can be epigastric or, or abdominal pain, non-specific or they do come with obstructive jaundice. Um, so whatever the clinical presentation is, it's not going to matter. Once we found uh, the uh, liver mass, we will need to find out uh, uh, what has caused that. And my advice to you is whenever you hear of any clinical problem, try to think uh, ahead as to what could this be. And that question is basically what we mean by the differential diagnosis. So as you uh, discover the uh, mass, then you think uh, what's actually is, com uh, is causing this mass? What, it can, what can it, this mass be? And you can divide them in, uh, in your head, whether you know it's a, a primary uh, from the liver or metastatic. As we know, the liver is the commonest or, uh, organ in the body that get uh, metastases from cancers of the gastrointestinal tract, the lung and the breast and uh, other cancers. Or they could be primary uh, lesions to uh, the uh, liver. And again, these primary lesions, they can be either um, benign or uh, malignant. Um, so I have got a short list for you here. There might be other uh, reason. Uh, but I'm only going to focus on the uh, clinically uh, relevant and common uh, issues. So it could be focal nodular hyperplasia. And the, from its name, it's a hyperplastic uh, lesion that happen in the uh, liver, usually in response to uh, either uh, estrogen in the oral contraceptive pills or anabolic uh, steroids in young athletes uh, who take that to boost their uh, muscular power. Um, and it's particularly common, more so common in women than in men. And I sh should emphasize here that um, I have seen mistakes made when uh, the uh, re radiologist has reported uh, a lesion to be focal uh, nodular hyperplasia in a man in their 50s and 60s. And I, my general advice is that do not accept the diagnosis of focal nodular hyperplasia in a male in general. Just to question the uh, it could happen, yes, but just question that uh, uh, diagnosis. Uh, and keep in mind that this could be something else. Hemangioma is one of the uh, very common lesions that we see in the liver and um, in autopsy series. It's probably affected about 1% or uh, about 10% in fact of the population. It 
seven to ten percent, I would say, uh, and uh, they are benign and you don't have to do anything about them. They are just like a hemangioma anywhere. Uh, the most common uh, visceral organ to get hemangioma is the liver. And then we have got the other rare lesions, such as the angiomyelol lipoma uh, and schwannomas and connective tissue disorders. Uh, they are very rare, so you don't need to uh, worry about the, them too much. Uh, the other lesion is liver adenoma. Again, this is an uh, uncommon clinical scenario. Uh, it can overlap the diagnosis with foconodular hyperplasia, uh, but keep uh, in your mind that uh, liver adenoma pathologically is different from uh, focal nodular hyperplasia. Adenoma is a true neoplastic lesion that has got the potential to become malignant. So we deal with them in a different, uh, and recognize a different uh, category of uh, disease. Um, and of course, we have got the, perf uh, the hepatocellular uh, carcinoma, uh, which develop usually in a cirrhotic uh, liver, uh, but it can happen in about 5% of, of the cases in non cirrhotic uh, liver. Also, the liver is the site of uh, what we call peripheral cholangial carcinoma, which is a mass forming type of cholangial carcinoma that happen in the liver parenchyma. It arises from the um, ductal uh, epithelium, uh, which is uh, the tributaries of the biliary tree, uh, the minute ones in the peripheral part of the uh, liver. Uh, it's not a common disease, but you do, we do see a fair bit of that. So it's important to keep cholangial carcinoma as a primary liver cancer. And then you go the metastatic lesions, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, the liver is the most common site for metastases from gastrointestinal cancers, and that can be anywhere from the gastroesophageal junction down to the uh, rectum, including the uh, pancreas, obviously. And also we have to keep in mind lymphomas, and that's particularly in young uh, patients. If, uh, uh, I wouldn't say it happens in only young patients, but it can be a diagnostic dilemma in, in young people because we are used to see more lymphoma in older people. Uh, so when you see a, a lesion in the liver, keep lymphoma in your uh, differential diagnosis. Uh, it's important to uh, know though that usually when uh, there is a lymphoma uh, that involves primarily uh, the liver, there might be other lymph nodes or the spleen could be uh, involved, and usually the lesions are multifocal. So it's not a, just a single mass, it's multiple masses in the uh, liver. Well, metastases can be either a single or multiple, uh, and there is an overlap between these two categories. Uh, that can be, uh, uh, that can come in details uh, later on on how to uh, deal with these uh, lesions, and uh, uh, the workup that will lead to the uh, final diagnosis. Now, the initial evaluation, if we ask you about the initial evaluation, I can't overemphasize the importance of clinical history and physical examination in this uh, particular situation. And history in these patients is of a uh, very uh, significant uh, importance. Uh, and it's one of the main steps to establish the diagnosis. So what do we want to know from the patients? We want to know if they have good risk or known risk for hepatic uh, uh, chronic liver disease, which leads to uh, cirrhosis, whether they are known or they have risk factors. And the risk factors are well known, which is the alcohol intake, history of hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and um, uh, also their injectable drug abuse, because most people uh, in the uh, Western uh, world who get hepatitis C, they do acquire that by sharing uh, needles for uh, injectable uh, addictive drugs. So we need to ask them particularly about that issue. Lots of these patients, they will be drinking as well. So they will have uh, two reasons, but um, uh, we need to identify each one separately. We need any uh, female and the uh, childbearing age, we need to know whether they have been on estrogen-containing contraceptive pills and how long they have been on that. Usually take years for the uh, liver to develop focal nodular hyperplasia in women who use oral contraceptive pills. Um, 
we need to ask the patient about the history of hepatitis, if they have ever been diagnosed with uh, hepatitis. The problem, though, comes with the, the fact that hepatitis C and hepatitis B are chronic disease, and they don't always have an initial uh, acute attack. Uh, it could happen in hepatitis B, uh, but it's not uh, uh, the case in hepatitis C. Alcohol intake, very important. Uh, we need to ask them about family history of hemochromatosis or personal history of hemochromatosis. Now, hemochromatosis is a, a disease where there is um, defective absorption of iron in the gastrointestinal system that will lead to uh, an iron overload, and the liver will try to cope with the uh, with the iron overload and uh, store it in copper cells inside the liver. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, derivatives and metabolites of the of iron are uh, toxic to the liver substance that eventually lead to liver cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. We need to ask them about their uh, history, cancer history. Have the patient ever been diagnosed with the uh, uh, gastrointestinal cancers that like they had a bowel resection uh, years ago, or uh, they had stomach cancer, or esophageal cancer, or any type of cancer, including lung and breast, and these are the most common cancers that metastasize to the liver. And then if there is none like that, we ask them about recent history of endoscopies, whether they have had in the last year or two a gastroscopy and a colonoscopy. And that will add to the information that we have uh, about the, uh, the, the source of the lesion if it is metastatic. We need to consider other cancers, and I need to emphasize um, the importance of uh, melanoma. Uh, now in Australia, melanoma is a uh, common uh, occurrence, unfortunately, and um, it metastasizes to the liver, and it can uh, metastasize uh, following removal of the primary lesion uh, in a variable period of time. So the primary could have been diagnosed more than five years ago, uh, and uh, they present with uh, a metastatic melanoma uh, to the uh, liver. Uh, so we need to uh, examine the patient as well in cases where we don't find a reason. We need to uh, map their skin if you think it could be a melanoma, uh, examining the areas that are hidden to the patient, which is the back of the arms, the neck, and uh, their back, uh, and back of the shoulders, which are relatively common sites for uh, malignant melanoma. So that's the initial evaluation in terms, obviously, you need to take the rest of their history, medical history and medications, uh, and any history of surgery, cardiovascular respiratory uh, disorders. You need to keep these in, um, in the uh, picture because they will contribute to the management of the patients uh, overall. Now, once we have examined the patients and we've got an idea, hopefully, uh, uh, about their health and their history, we start writing investigations. And it's the same old cliche. We start with the bloods and then we do the imaging. Uh, with the blood, so the first thing you want to do uh, that will come to your mind is uh, liver function test, obviously. Uh, you will do the rest of the routine bloods, which is the full blood count, their urea, and electrolytes. Uh, but we need to know their liver function test. And when I say the liver function test, we have to be uh, careful about how to interpret uh, liver function uh, in any patient. Um, so the parenchymal disease and liver cirrhosis is characterized by a high alkaline for, uh, for ALT uh, and probably GGT and alkaline phosphorase will be raised to some extent, but not, uh, not extremely high, unlike the obstructive uh, picture. There are other factors that we'll, we will need to consider when we say liver function tests. So we have the bilirubin level. These are, the synthetic function is the key to assess any uh, liver disease and the physiologic reserve of the liver. And it rests on the synthetic function. And the synthetic function is measured by the level of number one, bilirubin, number two, albumin, number three, their prothrombin time, or the international normalized ratio of prothrombin time, the INR. So we look at these three points. And obviously in the blood test also, we look at the platelet counts if they are low in people with uh, liver cirrhosis and portal hypertension. And we ask for hepatitis serology. And by the hepatitis serology, we want hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Uh, and uh, you get the results afterward to tell you if the patient needs specific 
uh, antiviral treatment uh, if they are positive for that. We do ion studies to rule out hemochromatosis. Now, serum capara, I put it in there, is not a common disease. Well, sin disease, not a common disease, uh, but um, uh, you might see one or two in your uh, career. Uh, so, uh, and, and it is a uh, disease that can lead to uh, liver failure and uh, hepatocellular carcinoma as well. Now, I kept it uh, um, very concise, just to emphasize the importance of the uh, salient points here uh, in order to uh, make it uh, manageable to you. Um, these are the bloods that I would uh, uh, request initially, and then I do tumor markers. And the tumor markers, if you think about the tumor markers, for a uh, general surgeon who deal with the gastrointestinal tract, this will mean the CA, and that is the cancer marker that goes up in epithelial cancers, including lung cancer, but we may use it for uh, bowel cancer. It can be useful also in stomach cancer and in gallbladder cancer, but to lesser extent. Number two, CA199. Uh, these are all antigens that you test for, and uh, CA199 is pancreatobiliary epithelial uh, antigen. So it will go up in people who have uh, cancer of the pancreas, cancer of the uh, bowel duct, cancer of the uh, gallbladder to uh, some extent, and cholangiocarcinoma in the uh, peripheries of the liver. And that's why we uh, use it for as a diagnostic and a follow-up uh, uh, measure. You need to measure the alpha fetoprotein because always when you find a mass in the liver, you would think that it's possibly hepatocellular carcinoma. And the specific uh, tumor marker is the alpha fetoprotein. It's also used for other uh, uh, embryonal type of tumors, uh, but uh, uh, say in the ovaries of the cases, but here we uh, emphasize on it because it goes up with hepatocellular carcinoma. We also send chromogranin A. Now chromogranin A is a marker for carcinoid tumor or neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas and the rest of the gastrointestinal tract. Regardless of the origin of the carcinoid or the neuroendocrine tumor, chromogranin level will go up. So we get these um, uh, results, um, and while we are waiting for that, then we will start about the imaging, and the process of imaging is uh, kind of, you take it in steps, so you start with uh, uh, the usual things. Uh, usually the patient uh, would have had either a CT of the abdomen or ultrasound of the, uh, of the liver, and you take it from there. So if they had an ultrasound scan, uh, I do chest, abdomen, and pelvis. If they had only CT of the abdomen, we do the chest, the abdomen, and the uh, pelvis to have an idea about uh, their uh, lungs. It will show us uh, uh, the thyroid if there is any, any uh, nodule, uh, and it will show us the mediastinum if there are uh, enlarged lymph nodes, uh, and we obviously looking for lung metastases or lung primary that could be uh, the source of the, uh, of the uh, lesion, could, could be either way. Uh, women who haven't had a mammogram in the last few years, so in the last two years or so, or they have families, strong families of uh, uh, breast cancer, they will need to have a physical examination and uh, a mammogram at least, or a mammogram and ultrasound scan. Now, MRI, we is a, the next level of, of imaging that we use. Um, and that will be useful for the diagnosis of um, hepatocellular carcinoma that does not look typical on CT scan. Now, I need to tell you that hepatocellular carcinoma, the diagnosis is radiologic, usually without the need to take a biopsy. Uh, and the radiologists have a scheme to characterize them according to the Lee rad li rad criteria for liver uh, lesions, and usually we'll be able to uh, confirm the diagnosis on CT scan, um, but every now and then we will need uh, MRI. The benefit of the MRI is that it will uh, show more lesions than the, uh, than the CT scan. It will pick probably in about 5-10% 10 per, 10 of uh, people another nodule in the uh, liver uh, and often what we do with the MRI we give them this contrast which is called the primavist. Primavist is a gadex, uh, gadex state, 
uh, and it is a hepatobiliary marker or hepatobiliary uh, contrast. Uh, the reason I say that is that because the usual gadolinium is a vascular contrast, which means that you give it intravenously, it goes into the circulation and through the circulation and then the kidneys will uh, get rid of it uh, by excreting that. And uh, the usual gadolinium, like the uh, intravenous contrast that we use for the CT scan, do not go into the hepatocytes, while primovist does, goes into the hepatocytes. How, it, how will it differentiate though between hepatocellular carcinoma and the rest of the liver? Now, hepatocellular carcinoma have abnormal hepatocytes. They are non-functioning. Uh, they don't function like a normal hepatocyte. So they do not take the primovist, which means that in a delayed hepatobiliary phase, which will be taken a bit somewhere between 20 to 30 minutes after injecting the primovist, the hepatocellular carcinoma will look as a dark hole in the liver. So it's totally washed out with no contrast in it in the delayed phase. Now, for the patient, if you are suspecting uh, gastrointestinal uh, cancers, uh, then we will uh, upscale the investigation if we haven't uh, found the source of the uh, primary yet and the patient hasn't had endoscopies in the last year or two. We usually do a gastroscopy and a colonoscopy to rule out um, a primary source in the gastrointestinal tract. Now, when do we use a PET scan? The PET scan we will reserve that for the staging phase. So it doesn't mean that uh, the PET scan will be the magic that you rely on to look for um, the primary, uh, but it will be used later on in the case when uh, we have discovered the uh, usually the source of the uh, a primary, or we think the primary, there might be no primary, it might be a lymphoma, then the PET scan will be vital in this uh, situation for the purposes of uh, staging metastatic cancers and uh, lymphomas. So it will come later on in the, uh, in the uh, PACE. <coughs> now the role of liver biopsy is uh, limited um, and in general uh, I advise you not to think about liver biopsy until you consult with either a hepatologist or a, a hepatobiliary uh, surgeon because we use it very selectively um, and we only biopsy it in case where there is no diagnosis that can be made on uh, other investigation which means that uh, uh, we, we think this might be uh, malignant or lymphoma whether it, and the malignant whether it's metastatic or uh, primary and uh, uh, there is no role particularly when there is no role for surgery because often you find that we might opt just to resect the lesion rather than uh, biopsy it. But that decision is uh, a bit more complex. Now we will do face, uh, we do face uh, sometimes dilemmas in the uh, diagnosis. Uh, and that means uh, that we have got a liver lesion, but we actually are not sure. And um, uh, it looks benign, uh, and there is no risk of malignancy, or the young patient, or we think it might be just a typical hemangioma, or small and difficult to characterize below than one centimeter. Then we do have the window of time to uh, follow the patient up with a surveillance. And we do, in this case, a CT scan, if they had CT scan, uh, Usually, before that, they would have had a CT scan. Uh, but if they had MRI, we will uh, do MRI so we can compare uh, likes, likes. Uh, so with that case, we do uh, a surveillance. We could advise a surveillance. Also, if we think it might be atypical uh, hemangioma, then uh, surveillance is a reasonable uh, option as long as it doesn't take uh, too long to make the uh, diagnosis uh, and we need to make sure the patient is happy uh, with that approach and so you don't leave them uh, with the anxiety of worrying about the possibilities. So in a nutshell I think that's what I need to tell you but I will just take um, some time and run a few pictures for you just for the sake of um, explanation. So. This is a CT scan for a patient with hepatocellular carcinoma. And the typical appearance of the hepatocellular carcinoma, it shows a non-rim arterial enhancement. So in the arterial phase, which is the image on your left-hand side, 
you, you see how the uh, mass is uh, hyper uh, dense uh, so it enhances really uh, very early and too much compared to the rest of the liver because tumors in general in the liver uh, whether they are primary or secondary are usually provided mainly by arterial blood so that there will be a bigger blush on the arterial face and on your right hand side you could see the hepatic veins here so this is a delayed phase or a portal venous phase and the uh, contrast managed to wash out so the mass looks hypo dense compared to the rest of the liver that's a typical behavior of a hepatocellular carcinoma it will behave like that also in uh, uh, on MRI uh, but in certain cases they are atypical but if we see a lesion like that in a patient with known uh, liver disease a primary uh, liver disease and they are uh, good uh, liver cirrhosis then there is no need to uh, to biopsy that or to investigate further it's likely to be a hepatocellular carcinoma The other second lesion that we uh, see very often is uh, focal nodular hyperplasia. Again, hyperplasia from the uh, by uh, definition is hyperplastic uh, lesion and it's not a neoplastic process. They do not have any complication. They do not bleed, they do not rupture, and they do not uh, uh, change to cancer. Uh, so it's essential to uh, achieve the diagnosis. And once we got the diagnosis, there is no need for further uh, uh, investigations we just ask the patient to uh, stop the contraceptive pills and use other forms of contraception and usually the lesion will uh, shrink uh, on a uh, surveillance scans that could be taken later again hyper, uh, hyperplastic lesions or nodular hyperplasia in the liver it will enhance rapidly on the arterial phase as you can see here so it's a bit hyperdense compared to the rest of the liver, not as vivid as it is in hepatocellular carcinoma, but it's still it's a bit more, um, more dense. Um, but the difference is, if you get a CT scan on the delayed images or the portal venous phase, uh, it will be totally iso-intense compared to the rest of the liver, and you will not be able to distinguish it from the rest of the liver. It will have exactly the same uh, density. There is a characteristic uh, thing in, in focal nodular hyperplasia. You see that uh, stellate shape uh, gray area in the center of the lesion with these, what we call spoke wheel appearance. That's characteristic of focal nodular hyperplasia, but it only happens in about somewhere between 60 and 70% of the cases. So some of them do uh, be, uh, become uh, problematic because of the uh, of the absence of the central scar often there will be an artery uh, that supplies the area on the uh, periphery of the lesion as well so the clinical context here is very important in addition to uh, the behavior of the focal hyperplasia on the con arterial and venous um, contrast and the history of contraceptive pills it's usually reassuring that this lesion is a focal nodular hyperplasia rather than any other type of lesion. The problem is sometimes differentiating this uh, focal nodular hyperplasia from liver cell adenoma. But liver cell adenoma or liver adenoma is a uh, very uncommon uh, lesion. It's also of crucial importance to uh, have a, a mental image of how the hemangioma behave on uh, the multi-phase uh, imaging or here we have the multi-phase CT scan on the non-contrast you see it's a uh, less dense than the rest of the uh, liver material so it's hypo uh, intense once you give the arterial contrast there is this pattern of enhancement and it's called peripheral nodular enhancement that's the first part of it peripheral and nodular so it's not diffuse it's kind of blotches here and there on the peripheries of the uh, lesion and then it's go, uh, coming from outside toward the center so it's a sentry petal pattern of filling 
the larger enhancement nodular and then the filling continues toward the center on the portal venous phase and on the delayed phase on the washout phase it will look more or less uh, I wouldn't say homogeneous but at least the whole lesion is intensified and it is hyperdense compared to the liver parenchyma. So that's how a typical hemangioma would behave on the uh, on the CT scan. Hemangiomas are very um, uh, common, uh, and uh, it's often helpful if you've got the diagnosis of hemangioma on a patient. Uh, you just need to check whether they had a scan in the last uh, a few years or so, because it will would have been there for a long uh, time usually. Now the other lesion that's primary liver cancer is cholangiocarcinoma, and I chose this one uh, for you. Um, now the pattern of enhancement in uh, cholangiocarcinoma is usually, uh, again, it's, it's hyper intense on the arterial uh, phase, uh, so it's a peripheral enhancement in a rim shape. There is kind of a, you could uh, imagine a rim like a circle around the uh, lesion. It's not. Uh, homogeneous, it is kind of heterogeneous, but if the lesion, if this lesion was small, it would probably look more uh, homogeneous uh, rim type of uh, uh, enhancement. Uh, but unfortunately, cholangiocarcinoma doesn't behave uh, in a particular pattern, uh, and it can be difficult to uh, diagnose uh, radiologically. Um, and the management then will depend on the clinical situation. Now, liver metastases, as we said, it's the most common uh, lesion in the liver, uh, and usually the uh, origin is uh, GI, GI cancers, uh, cancers of the breast, cancers of the uh, bronchus. Uh, and typically, a metastatic lesion, if they are multiple, if they have got cancer of the pancreas uh, or uh, uh, esophagus of the colon, sometimes the, the, you see these uh, lesions uh, and uh, uh, they behave kind of a typical, uh, in a typical fashion on portal venous phase. Uh, usually they are uh, hypodense compared to the uh, rest of the liver. They do pull, pull, uh, get poorly enhanced uh, because of the process of uh, necrosis and loss of vascularity in these lesions. So they will always, in the uh, venous phase, look uh, like they are hypodense or hypointense compared to the uh, liver and lastly, it's important and worthwhile mentioning metastases to the liver from carcinoid lesions or neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas or the gastrointestinal tract. Now, these lesions are hypervascular, so they are they have that characteristic pattern of enhancements, very homogeneous, uh, hyper uh, dense compared to the uh, rest of the uh, liver. Uh, and that's uh, mainly in the uh, arterial uh, phase uh, and uh, they behave in that typical pattern uh, usually and they can be easily diagnosed. Um, and carcinoid tumors are important to know about because they can be uh, treated surgically if they are uh, manageable or even if, they, uh, if there's a, a big mass or massive uh, liver metastases in the, and 90% of it can be removed we will also pursue um, a surgical uh, solution to the uh, patient. Now, I thought this is um, uh, hopefully uh, will give you a good idea about uh, primary liver lesions and how we generally uh, deal with them. Uh, I would love to hear from you. Please leave me your uh, comments and suggestions, uh, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, you like my channel and subscribe to it uh, so we can keep going. Thank you very much.